Good day, everyone, and welcome to HLB International's tax webinar, The Impact of Wayfair. Today, you will have four panelists from the HLB US member firms. My name is Shannon Lamont, and I'm a partner in the International Tax Services Group of Ide Bailey. Also joining us is Michael Mastriani, a senior manager with Barry Dunn. Also, Lady McNair, a principal with Witham Smith and Brown, and David Zacharellis, a partner with Siler. And to kick it off, David is going to talk with us about the basic summary of the Wayfair case. Well, thanks, Shannon. Uh, by now, most people in the, in the U.S. are familiar with the case. It's, covered, it's been covered in so many media outlets. But this uh, case, South Dakota versus Wayfair, was really uh, centered on whether an out-of-state seller with no physical presence in a state can be required to collect and remit sales tax imposed by uh, the consumer state. Uh, and you know, it might be worth mentioning, as, as the case did, uh, of some prior cases which are really on point, specifically the Bella Hess and Quill case, where the court held in those cases that an out-of-state seller's liability to collect and remit the tax to the consumer state depended on whether the seller had a physical presence in that state. That is, mere shipment of goods into a consumer state following an order from a catalog, for instance, did not satisfy the physical presence requirement. In addition, Quill, which was often referenced in the case, the South Dakota versus uh, Wayfair case, the Quill case held that a state may not tax sales by a seller with no physical presence in the state. Now, most of us are familiar with the idea of nexus, which is generally uh, described as a minimum, minimum connection with the jurisdiction that creates the ability under federal and state law for the jurisdiction to impose rules and regulations upon the organization. Those, that's kind of a legal term, and most of us know that typically there needs to be some kind of connection. We look in our practice to whether or not there are sales representatives there are marketing arrangements, or there's commission agents, uh, perhaps other things like a real estate property, other other factors that which would which would uh, lead to that the idea that there is physical presence. And then the, essentially, this court case was really decided uh, relative to the U.S. Constitution's understanding of due process and the Commerce Clause, which is a, something beyond our discussion today, but it's worth looking about because that, that really is some of the hinges that, that impact the case. In this particular case, South Dakota has a sales tax, like many states, and like most states, without a physical presence, South Dakota must rely on its residents to pay the use tax owed on their purchases from out-of-state resellers, and as most states find that 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 uh, is pretty dismal. They get very few compliant uh, um, taxpayers just volunteering sales tax. So South Dakota, in this case, issued a direct challenge to the physical presence requirement through an economic nexus provision in their law, in their statute. And that economic activity, in their case, alone triggered the tax collection. No physical presence was needed. Uh, so effective May 1st, 2016, South Dakota started requiring out-of-state retailers to register and collect South Dakota sales tax if either of the following are met. There was a gross revenue test, which was essentially those, those um, uh, tangible personal property, property transferred electronically, or services delivered to, into South Dakota if those revenue exceeded $100,000 and whether or not the seller sold tangible personal property, product transfer electronically or services um, on more than uh, 200 or more separate transactions. Those were the two hinges on their law. And over time, other states have, have implicated and have passed similar statutes, but in this case, it was South Dakota that the court was looking at. And Wayfair was a, 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 homes, a homes good seller that would, would, uh, would shipped into South Dakota uh, home goods that people purchased online. And, uh, you know, I, I think that is the basic summary of the case. And as we all know, um, the Supreme Court held in favor of South Dakota and 
And what's happened is now we're trying to digest what this means from a sales tax perspective and an income tax perspective. And I think, um, Mike, you're going to talk a little bit about the, sale, the income tax perspective and Lady, you're going to talk a little bit about the sales tax. And, and Mike, why don't you kick it off and tell us what y- your thoughts are as you're, we're now, I guess, almost half a year after the case <laughs> and how yeah. we're looking at this for from an income tax perspective. Yeah, that's right, Dave, and thanks for kicking it off to me. You know, to a lot of people at first glance, it would seem odd that a Supreme Court decision that dealt specifically with remote sellers' sales use obligations would have an impact on taxpayers' income tax liabilities. However, uh, one needs to look beyond the facts in the Wayfarer's case to the court's holding that in order for a state to impose a tax under the Commerce Clause and its substantial nexus standard, physical presence is not required. So the distinction between Commerce Clause nexus for sales use purposes and income tax purposes arose a short time after Quill. After the physical presence holding under the Commerce Clause was reaffirmed in 1992 by Quill, as David briefly mentioned, the South Carolina Supreme Court held a short time thereafter that an out-of-state IP licensing company with no physical presence in the state, meaning no property or payroll, was subject to the state's income tax. Now, most practitioners on the line recognize this concept as Jeffrey Nexus. However, specifically in the case in Jeffrey, the court held that the state of South Carolina's economic nexus doctrine met the substantial nexus standard under the Commerce Clause, and that Quill was specifically limited to sales use tax cases. So most importantly, the court in Jeffrey allowed the state of South Carolina to levy an income tax in the absence of a taxpayer's physical presence, provided that the taxpayer purposely directed its business activities into the state and exploited the state's market. So since Jeffrey, uh, many additional states have passed economic nexus statutes pertaining to income-based taxes based upon that case. Uh, the statutes have evolved in varying forms. Some which, ex- uh, some which have been enacted have been very similar to those in Jeffrey, while more recently, numerous states have enacted factor-based or agency-based economic nexus rules. So an example of a factor-based rule is uh, that a state that has enacted one is Alabama. Um, In Alabama, a taxpayer has substantial nexus in the state if the taxpayer's property, payroll, or sales in the state exceed a certain dollar threshold during a taxable period. Uh, On the agency-based nexus nexus side, uh, although there's significant case law behind agency nexus, agency nexus generally involves imputing nexus on an out-of-state taxpayer that uses non-employee third parties like an independent contractor to solicit or perform certain significant activities on the taxpayer's behalf in the state. I'm sure most people on the call realize that agency nexus has further evolved into another body of law called click-through nexus. So the key with this background is that the US Supreme Court chose not to hear the Jeffrey case. They denied cert. Uh, nor did they hear any state income tax nexus cases related to the Commerce Clause. So as a result, many taxpayers began to challenge the constitutionality of economic nexus for state income tax purposes through no nexus determinations and their filing positions, meaning if a taxpayer, uh, the only presence it had in a state was economic nexus, it was, it was an economic presence, excuse me, that that taxpayer would opt out of filing a return. So it's my opinion and that of many practitioners alike that Wayfair is not limited solely to sales use nexus based upon the holding in the case, historical case law, and trends we've seen in the industry. Most mm-hmm. recently, oh, sorry. You, hi, Mike. This is Lady. Just wanted to um, chime in in here just on the sales tax side where I've seen income tax nexus arises, and we'll talk more about this down um, on, on the presentation later on, is when we do register a company to do business in the state for sales tax purposes because 
they've met the Wayfair requirements in the states. Now somehow because of the Secretary of State registration, it's pulling my clients in the state for income tax purposes. So um, we've seen Wayfair totally affecting our clients on the income tax side due to the Wayfair because of the Secretary of State registrations that we have to file for sales tax purposes. No, and that's right. And I think to your point, lady, the other the other caveat to that is when you're, you know, Wayfair was specifically a sales use case, but when you're analyzing VDAs or doing an analysis, you also have to do that hand in hand with income tax nexus. To your point, if you're filing VDAs, depending on the state's law, you may have to apply uh, for both income. There may be an opportunity to apply for both income and sales tax all at once. So it's it's a really good practical point. Um, and so uh, to that point, you know, Mike, just in, in case um, those on the presentation are, are not familiar with the term BDA, um, that, that is a voluntary disclosure agreement that can be entered into the state if you think you may have had nexus in prior years and the state hasn't contacted you yet um, and you need to come clean, so to speak. So just wanted to clarify that. No, that's great. Thanks, Shannon. Yep. So. I think to to both you know your point and to Lady's point that once state legislation regarding economic nexus for sales use subsides, that you know states are going to be looking for the next revenue stream, and dollar hungry states were, are going to start focusing their attention on you know the few jurisdictions with economic nexus provisions for income tax purposes, and begin to pass similar lit legislature based upon the Wayfair decision. So as, as we talked about, that's just kind of a quick background um, regarding, uh, you know, state nexus for income tax purposes, predecessing Wayfair. So I'm going to transition slightly and talk a little bit more about Wayfair uh, and how it is in impacting inbound companies doing business in the U.S. Here at Barry Dunn, we have a lot of inbound clients, uh, specifically for those that don't know, generally an inbound client is a client that's based in a foreign country that's doing business in the United States. And I often find myself and other practitioners alike, we're constantly relying, reminding inbound clients that nexus for state income tax purposes applies to both domestic US as well as foreign companies doing business in the States. And well, you know, what's the reason behind that? Well. Specific to Wayfair, there's nothing in the Wayfair case that limits the holding, it's holding to domestic U.S. businesses. As David mentioned, it was a commerce clause analysis. However, the case did not analyze the impact of the foreign commerce clause on foreign companies doing business in the U.S. That's a little bit different analysis, um, which involves a review of the complete auto test and some additional factors, which is kind of beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today. However, just recognize that the analysis is somewhat different. So when analyzing inbound nexus for inbound companies, it's important to remember that although similar conceptually, the analysis for determining whether a company is subject to federal income tax is a different analysis than that which is required for determining whether income and or sales use nexus exists for state tax purposes. So. For federal income tax purposes, the analysis generally requires a review of the taxpayer's activities in the U.S. and the applicable Foreign Comprehensive Income Tax Treaty to evaluate whether a permanent establishment exists in the states. So as a result, many taxpayers oftentimes assume that if they complete this analysis and determine that there is no USPE, a permanent establishment, then no further entity level filing obligations in the U.S. are required. However, generally the protections afforded by these various international treaties are limited to the application of federal income-based taxes. These treaties do not afford protections for state income nor sales use taxes. So the analysis required for state income and sales use tax purposes involves a review of each state's nexus rules applicable to each tax type, as well as the taxpayer's operations in each state. Based upon that review, a determination needs to be made whether an income and or a sales use filing obligation exists. So if income tax nexus is tripped, 
treaty conformity needs to be evaluated and the state's conformity as to federal taxable income as defined by the code needs to be assessed. Noting that many states only tax effectively connected income and US source income subject to withholding, while other jurisdictions may require taxpayers to recalculate the foreign entity's taxable income as, as, as if no treaty was in effect. So even if it's determined that income may that no income tax may be due based upon reliance, the state's conformity to an income-based treaty or the definition of taxable income, taxpayers still need to be wary of states which impose franchise taxes or minimum taxes which may be due. On the flip side, uh, if sales use nexus is tripped, uh, I think Lady and David are gonna discuss in more detail, but just at a 10,000 foot level, taxpayers need to establish procedures for compliance, such as taxability, applicable exemptions, registration and documentation requirements, as well as procedures for collection and for non-filing. So one of the questions that I often get from, you know, a lot of my clients who are specifically inbound clients are, you know, hey, I'm, I'm based all the way in China, I'm halfway around the world. What is state X really gonna do or how are they really gonna impose an assessment or collection requirement on me all the way in China? And so, if we set aside platform statutes, which may require sales use taxes to be collected as they enter the US, the truth is if that a company has no US physical presence or assets, it may be difficult for a state taxing authority to oppose a collection requirement. That being said, companies generally will go through due diligence at some point in their lives. And most salt practitioners recognize that sales use tax obligations may pose one of the larger successor liability issues when completing due diligence. So if, if a liability is found, it's likely that target may be required to become compliant or may need to provide an additional contractual indemnification. So in short, one of the things that we, you know, we've been, I've been telling a lot of my clients is they can either comply and pay now or they can pay later. If later, it may be more expensive given the cost of accessing historical data, the imposition of late penalties or in interest, and or the cost of researching or applying for relevant voluntary disclosure agreements. So from a pr practical perspective, whether you're domestic or foreign, you know, wh what does Wayfair mean for your company's income tax compliance? So first, Taxpayers need to evaluate historical filing positions based upon Wayfair, including non-filed returns, based upon the taxpayer's position that the only activity in the state was an economic presence. Since the retroactivity issue is unsettled and generally there is no statute of limitations for a non-filed return, it is unclear how sympathetic states will be to non-filers. So, Taxpayers need to complete an exposure analysis and quantify any liabilities or in potential outstanding liabilities. Additionally, uh, to the extent applicable, taxpayers should consider entering into voluntary disclosure agreements based upon their specific facts and circumstances. Second, taxpayers should review sales sourcing. So for non-tangible personal property sales, meaning sales of services, most practitioners recognize that the enactment of market-based sourcing provisions constitutes a large legislative trend impacting uh, income-based taxes. To the extent a state has enacted a factor or economic nexus rule, the sourcing of those sales may drive whether an out-of-state taxpayer has nexus, economic nexus in that jurisdiction. So for example, if a taxpayer is rendering services uh, into the state of California, which is a market-based state, and those sales exceeded the economic nexus threshold there of $580,000, that triggers California nexus. The point being that the taxpayer's sales by state calculation and nexus analysis become one and the same and may not require two separate determinations as they had historically prior to Wayfair. The third thing is that taxpayers need to reassess throwback rules, which are generally applicable to sales of tangible personal property. 
throw rack rules vary between the states, so it's really imperative to understand what subject to tax means under that state's definition and whether a taxpayer is actually subject to tax in another state post Wayfair. If so, throwback may not apply to all the taxpayer's sales and taxpayers should evaluate the impact on their sales apportionment factor accordingly. So for example, if you have a mass-based taxpayer selling tangible personal property California, uh, and you recognize that you should have filed a return in California based upon California's economic nexus provision, and the taxpayer ultimately files a California return, the sales factor in Massachusetts should be reevaluated as it's likely that those California sales are no longer subject to throwback, and the taxpayer may potentially be due a refund um, and it should explore those options if they are within the applicable statute of limitations. And lastly, taxpayers should reconsider reliance on PL 86272. Recall the Wayfair decision does not override public law 86272, which is federal law passed by the legislature. So even though a taxpayer may meet an economic nexus provision in a state, it doesn't necessarily mean the taxpayer will be subject to income tax in that jurisdiction. Recall 86272 prohibits a state from levying an income-based tax on an out-of-state company if the company's activities in a state are limited to the solicitation of orders for the sale of TPP and the orders are approved and filled from outside the state. Taxpayers often forget that when a state's economic nexus threshold is crossed, a taxpayer generally still has to file a return, even if it's protected by 86272. Recall, 86272 does not prote provide protection from a state's non-income-based taxes, such as minimum taxes and franchise taxes. So taxpayers need to evaluate those liabilities um, and consider paying estimates and uh, complying with those filing obligations accordingly. So, you know, without a physical presence requirement, taxpayers should keep abreast of new state legislation and the passage of further factor or economic-based presence laws, um, in addition to other broad nexus rules for income tax purposes, such as broadening the state's definition of doing business. They should continue to evaluate, and then with that, keeping that in mind, they should continue to evaluate their state compliance obligation and state compliance liabilities accordingly. So that was sort of, you know, talking about, as David mentioned, the impact of the income tax side of the Wayfair decision. And so I'm going to pass things off to Lady now, who's going to talk a little bit further about the sales use implications. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Well, hi, everyone. Excited to uh, be here and talk about my favorite subject, which is the Al Saxon Wayfair case. Wayfair case was probably the biggest and most important case for sales tax. Um, here in U.S., it, it, it's been a tremendous change to the way that we do things for sales tax purposes. Um, so it changed everything on how my clients should manage the sales tax function. Um, the Wayfair case, unfortunately, didn't address a couple of major items such as is there such thing as going forward or looking back and can the states um, impose the economic nexus prior to the Wayfair case. So that has been one of the most um, pro problematic items for my clients currently. Um, we are helping our clients become compliant post Wayfair, just looking into the state's activity and to see if they meet the Wayfair requirements. Um, unfortunately, in U.S., states have their own um, way of doing business. There's really no um, common grounds in regards to um, how many transactions or is there a common threshold that they impose um, on companies. So for example, um, it could be a state such as Washington or Pennsylvania where the threshold of revenue in the state is very small, um, $10,000 of sales. And then you'll have another states where, um, like Ohio, Massachusetts, where is five hundred thousand dollars of sales. So, um, and then also the Wayfair case or the South Dakota, the state of South Dakota, when they originally presented the economic nexus into their legislation, 
they had um, revenue and or a transaction amount. So what that means is um, the company should either meet the revenue threshold, which could be ten thousand or a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars, or a um, hundred or two hundred transaction. So this is very important for some of my clients who are on the smaller side because revenue-wise, the hundred transaction, two hundred transactions may translate into ten thousand dollars of revenue. However, now they still have to um, they still have nexus and they have filing requirements in in the states so um it's been kind of interesting to see originally when the wayfair case um was passed um i didn't think that the decision that the the case um uh the decision was taken the case was going to be that it was going to be upheld the economic nexus existed so it, it definitely shook the world um for for some of my clients especially because the compliance is so um, a burdensome um, in US because you have to file sales tax returns in every state and also they can be monthly or quarterly returns. So it's not just um, a yearly return. In addition to it, we the states um, or there are about 12 different sales tax rates in US. So what that means is that in order for my clients to become compliant, they actually have to have the right tools to, to capture the sales tax rate and also be able to file the sales tax returns. So we have states such as Alabama, Colorado, Arizona um, that have local sales tax filings. They have local jurisdictions that are independently run and they have their own independent forms that are required. So Alabama kind of was the leader in, 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 in this, and they actually came up with um, a great way of um, out-of-state sellers to file just one return without having to file 200 or 100 um, different local sales tax returns. Um, Colorado is catching up to it, um, and also I believe Arizona is also catching up to it. I haven't seen anything um, from Louisiana yet. Um, so what Wayfair means to my clients or, or to you guys is that there is um, there are there are going to be extra expenses that a company has to put into uh, the whole sales tax function in order to support it um, and to do the right thing. So the first step really is, do you as a um, company meet those economic thresholds or not in the state? If you do, then we need to figure out is what you're providing subject to sales tax or not in the state so one of the things that is common from uh, every state in us is that the sale of tangible personal property is always going to be subject to sales tax unless there are specific exemptions that are supported by an exemption certificate um, however Companies that provide software as a service or um, other products where the taxability varies significantly from state to the state, there needs to be a software tool in place in order to capture all these wild um, different aspects of sales tax on, on state per state basis. So as I noted, or as I said earlier, the first step would be determining if uh, if you have nexus or not, or if you meet this economic um, threshold. Obviously, when I say determining if you have nexus or not, it's not just economic nexus, it's actually do you have physical nexus too. Um, assuming there is no physical nexus and all you're doing in a state is having sales into that particular jurisdiction, the next step would be once you've determined nexus, is to understand the taxability of your product or services in the state. So um, about 20, over 20 some years ago, there was a notation that uh, services are always not subject to sales tax. And for someone that lives in California, that is probably the case. But for someone that lives and operates in New Jersey or New York, that is definitely not the case. So it's important to know the um, the taxability of the product in, in the jurisdictions or in the states. And the next step would be, okay, now that you have a good understanding of where you have nexus, where you have taxable sales, 
um, have actually have a process in place to collect any exemption certificates or resale certificates you may have. The next step would be, how do you bring all of this together? Um, it's, it, it's a burdensome act. It probably will take someone to full time do this on day to day basis. However, there are automated solutions out there available that can help with the, with the process. So um, Avalara is one of them. With them has partnered with Avalara, and we provide their services to our clients. And basically, um, what the uh, Avalara does is they have coded, embedded into their system, where they link the their tax codes to your or to our clients' revenue streams or product codes. And um, we we help as part of the implementation to decide what product codes should relate to the tax codes. So we make that connection so the system knows instantaneously should it collect sales tax or not. And if it should collect sales tax, um, what is the sales tax rate that it should collect? Also, how should this sales be sourced? So Mike talked about sourcing on the income tax side. On the sales tax side, it's also very important to make sure that you're sourcing the revenue accordingly and also for sales tax compliance, it becomes as hideous as of, um, a zip code, uh, excuse me, a zip code or um, uh, what people in my field will call it geo codes because they're more accurate than zip codes. So um, Avalara and um, there are other tools such as TextJar and Vertex. What they do is they have already codes embedded into their system that they can link into the billing system. And every time an invoice is issued or an order is issued, then the system knows to collect sales tax or not, what state to collect the sales tax, and also what county or, or, or local jurisdiction sales tax rate it should charge. So um, it's pretty fascinating for, for people that have been doing sales tax for a long time to actually have a software tool that can easily do all these functions because um, not too long ago these were kind of manually done and coded into the um, the ERP system, and um, they were hardly updated. The way that it works with the Avalara tool or a tax jar or a Vertex, these features, which meaning the, the taxability of products and the zip codes and the tax rates, they get updated very frequently, um, at least once a month. So with that being said is having a software system in place will help with mitigating some of the headaches that the Wayfair case brought into our clients. Um, obviously, as I tell all my clients, be aware because these are software tools. So obviously, you will need some human interactions and assistance and implementation and maintaining it going forward. But if they are set up correctly, then they can take away 98% of the work that somebody would manually have to capture it on a day-to-day basis. Um, so, you know, and once you put a system in place um, and you actually have um, a, a good way of being compliant, then it would be a good time for you to start thinking, okay, should you register or not? So this is also another um, uh, topic that I'm spending a lot of time with my clients um, uh, about. The reason for it being because the Wayfair case was passed in June a lot of states went effective as of July of this year. And then we had a bunch of states going live in October and November. And then we have a few states going live in January. Um, as of right now, we have about 34 states that have implemented some type of uh, Wayfair or economic nexus. And I predict that by end of next year, all states are going to be or have an economic nexus um, um, threshold into their statutes. So what should you do if you have all or if you plan accordingly with the software systems in place and you know the taxability? My clients should definitely or you guys should definitely consider to register. The Wayfair or the economic nexus is, is going nowhere. Um, so easier or faster that you register and um, you take a proactive approach, better it is. Um, if you, you know, choose to wait it out and see how this is going to affect you, then obviously there are some remedies in place, such as the VDA or the Voluntary Disclosure Agreement that um, a company can participate and enter into. Currently, we're helping a lot of our clients to do that. 
now we are talking only about six months of, of time period um, from the time that the Wayfair went live. So with that being said, and I know um, we have a bunch, a couple more other topics that we need to discuss. I will pass it on to David. Um, he will talk a little bit about how is Wayfair affecting financial statement. Um, also on my end, I've seen a lot of um, a lot of issues on that end, but David will go in detail and, and talk about some of those issues and how we can better plan. Well, thanks, Lady. I think we'll spend just a few minutes on, on, on that. And so many of us have been discussing the implications of this Supreme Court case with respect to income tax and sales tax. But then, of course, one needs to consider how it impacts accounting and your financial reporting obligations. And I think uh, it might just be worth noting uh, a couple of things. Um, as you're assessing your exposure to these states, you're going to probably end up with two buckets. You're going to either know for certain that there is a, a liability in that state, or perhaps you're not certain <laughs> if you've got a liability in that state. And I think from, an, from a, a financial statement reporting point of view, it's important to understand that. It's also a, a good to understand that the reporting rules are a little different between sales tax and income tax. I think a lot of us uh, intuitively know that. But with respect to sales tax, if, if your client believes it is certain that they will be subject to a liability for sales and use tax in a certain and particular state, then you, the liability should be recognized and measured on the financial statements pursuant to the provisions of that state. And it's important to reference uh, your understanding to FASB ASC 405, which is a discussion on liabilities. Uh, it, it's important to look at that because uh, that is a, a real liability and it can't be uh, released from the, um, from the financial statements unless, unless it's really um, um, the, the primary obligor is, has, has a basically released the liability to that particular client. So that's, that's a recording of a liability and it's, that, that's a certain liability under that section. However, many times our clients are uncertain if there is going to be an obligation in a given state. And I think then you need to look at the contingency rules under FASB ASC 450 and look at that guidance, which includes um, guidance for loss contingencies as to possible loss that will, that will be resolved when one or more future events occurs or fails to occur. Uh, and so you, you need to look at both of those rules with respect to recording the loss contingency or recording the liability and how that's going to be work itself out in the end and how it's going to come off the financial statements. I think also you need to reference uh, FASB ASC 740, which discusses income taxes, uh, uh, in, including guidance when there's uncertainty on whether or not an income tax should be imposed. But be aware that that, sec that uh, ASC 740 does not apply to sales and use tax because sales and use tax is not a tax that's based on income. So a handful of things to think about uh, moving forward, um, you know, looking at existing income tax positions, all of those must be reassessed at each balance sheet date based on the information you have at that point in time. And so the specific facts and circumstances of your client are really important to fulfill a real good analysis and that needs to be performed uh, during that financial statement period. Um, and so you, you've got an issue about June 21st, which is the date of the Supreme Court case that you'll have to work out with the auditors and whether or not that that assessment needs to be uh, performed or I should say the recording of the liability or loss contingency needs to be performed before those dates. Um, most of the states are looking at it um, are not looking at it retroactive they're looking at it going forward but although those are considerations you'll, you'll need to consider or think about when you're determining whether or not the liability should be recorded or a loss contingency should be recorded uh, now with that said it's as we've discussed today it's really important uh, for for us to really assess with our clients uh, determine exactly where Nexus is. And I'd be interested to hear from Mike and Lady on practically, maybe some practical tools, ideas, just really quickly, um, maybe in five or six minutes. How are you, a client calls you up and says, what are practically some ideas that I can go about 
looking at my state exposure, um, you know, I, I understand the rules. I've read the court case. I understand the idea behind it, but what are other people doing? Um, and uh, Mike, why don't I kick that off to you first and Lady Munch, why don't you chime in as well? Yeah, sure. You know, and, and David, I'll, I'll start on the income tax side. So, you know, from a practical perspective, honestly, a lot of the times it's information that the client already has, you know, it's, it's apportionment data, you know, which we maybe may be used from our prior year return. And so what it is, is kind of consolidating that data um, and then comparing that basically to the state's nexus rules. You know, a lot of, <clears throat> there's, everyone knows there's a lot of, you know, most practitioners on the phone recognize there's a lot of tools out there. There's a lot of smart charts. It's pretty easy to run a, a smart chart that had, you know, that explains the state's economic nexus rule, its physical presence rule, or if they have a factor base or agency nexus rule. And then what you can do is, you know, once you have those sort of two tools by side by side, the chart and the client's apportionment data by state, you can then compare them side by side to evaluate whether or not they've tripped, um, you know, some sort of economic type nexus threshold. And then once you do, once you sort of made that, you know, determination, then it, then it, the next step is really evaluating what the liability is going to be. You know, is the taxpayer, do they have taxable income? If so, you know, what does that look like? If they have a taxable loss, is there a significant franchise tax in the state? Are they sell, sellers of tangible personal property where they may be, uh, there may be PL 86272 protection. So, it's, those are sort of the first two steps. And then the third step is kind of where the rubber hits the road, where it's, it's taking all that da data and, and, you know, identifying, you know, hey, should we be filing returns in the states? What's our level of risk and our level of exposure that we're living, willing to, to live with? But, it, you know, if, if we have some larger liabilities out there and maybe those liabilities are historical, do we need to consider a VDA and would that be beneficial to us um, rather than, you know, in, in getting what's generally provided as a limited look back period for voluntary disclosure agreements, you know, to limit some of our historic exposure and then get us compliant going forward. So, um, if Lee, yeah. did you want to? Yeah, sure. No, I think that's a great that start. Skills. Yeah, thanks, Mike. That's a great, great start. I mean, the same process would be valid for sales tax purposes, too. What we've done is we have a Nexus questionnaire list, we call it, or schedule, and we tell our clients, let's start there. Um, you know, having the, the amount of sales by state and the transaction of, um, of, of um, transactions, the, the transaction count by state, that would be a great start. But what, what I find out, though, is most interesting that it's not just Wayfair Nexus that some of my clients have. They've also had physical nexus for a while, too. And as we are going through the economic nexus, um, you know, threshold and determining if they have economic nexus or not, we are also seeing that physical nexus has been present. So which is a little bit more complicated in regards to how do we move forward, right? Because at this point now we have to consider the past exposure. Um, but it's been interesting, I would have to say the least, on my clients that have, have had no physical nexus just economic nexus, and because of the audit purposes, we've actually had to work with the states for the states such as Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Ohio, Tennessee, where they imposed um, an earlier date for the economic nexus. So we had to work with them, and we've been successful in trying to get the states to agree to going forward versus remitting sales tax for the pack for the back period. For my e-com clients, this is pretty big because at this point they can't recoup the sales tax. Um, so it would have to come out of their pocket per se. So um, but the process really is trying to, you know, understand what their sales by state are, transaction per state, and then the taxability portion, that is also very um, challenging for some of my clients on the smaller side because Having guidance of taxability of your products in every state, if you provide a SaaS or a soft product, that is very expensive, you know? So it's been an interesting um, uh, experience for sure. I have to say, this is definitely not a cheap task for, for uh, the taxpayers. 
maybe we can um, wrap it up here, David, and if yeah. we can talk about what's next for in 2019, right? Um, sure. Where do we see or how Wayfair is going to continue affect um, um, companies and such? Uh, thanks, lady. I think it is important to kind of think where, where are we going in 2019? There was a an interesting blog that was uh, sent out uh, uh, at the week of Thanksgiving by an attorney, which hit the national press. Uh, he had the 10 top things he was thankful for in 2018, and one of them was Wayfair. <laughs> and I, I think he was looking at more his fees than anything else. But uh, we we need to consider um, it, it, it the case to be what it is for 2018. And where are we going for 2019? Lady, you mentioned the fact that well over 30 states have adopted uh, similar, um, maybe not so similar, but similar statutes in a sense, and that's not going to stop. Our our state here in California just this past week issued um, a, a new law of basically where California, now being one of the bigger states in the in the, in, in the union, are now going to be re requiring um, reporting on sales tax uh, starting uh, in 2019. And I think you're going to see more and more states uh, putting statutes on the books. I think the other trend you might see is that you you might see some states kind of back away from the transactions test and keep to a threshold test because the 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 Supreme Court case in the Wayfair d didn't really address some of the um, intricacies of understanding what a transaction is, uh, and I think that's going to be op open up um, many states to lawsuits and other other issues, which. Um, uh, I, I think that some of the states don't want to be bothered with. So you might see a trend in, in changing uh, the statute so it's a little easier to comply with. Uh, there are certainly some cases that are in the court right now. I think there is a case uh, uh, in the East Coast with, with, with respect to Crutchfield. I think that's going to be interesting to see where that, that, that ends up. But maybe the most important of all, from a tax policy point of view, to look at there's two cases right now in Congress one of the things I thought about when I read um, Wayfair back in June was, you know, why hasn't Congress issued some guidance here? And many of us have been asking the same thing. And I, there are two bills um, in the in the House right now. I, I don't, we don't really know how far they'll go. Uh, one of the bills um, is called the Online Sales Simplicity and Small Business Relief Act, and that bill would prohibit states from imposing retroactive laws. So only going forward laws uh, related to the collection of sales tax. It would, it would also prevent states from imposing sales tax collection duties until January 10th, 2019. And it would create an exemption for small businesses that sales less than $10 million of online sales don't, don't need to be reported. Um, that would be interesting to see where that goes. Now, the other bill that is in, in the House is called the Protecting Businesses from Burdensome Compliance Costs. And as you know, you, if you have a bill in the House, you have to have a contracting name to it. And that it's th that's their name. But that particular bill would prevent states from collecting sales and use tax if there is no physical presence. So we're seeing a, an issue of deferral of the rules, a moratorium on the rules. We'll see what happens. Uh, we're in a lame, lame duck session right now. But we'll see what happens when we have a uh, 116th Congress gets sworn in next year. And as they get in their seats, we'll see what um, what uh, what comes out of that. It, that'll be interesting for all of us to watch. But I think for now, the trend it continues to be the states are interested in pursuing this. Most of the states are not interested in pursuing retroactively. It is a prospective uh, um, law that they're going to be trying to uh, um, to apply. But just don't think that all states are going to not look at retroactive uh, enforcement. There, you know, as was mentioned, you might want to. Through some kind of a prior um, year um, agreement with the state. That that was and, yeah, uh, David, on the. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to. I was just going to mention on the retroactivity issue, um, I was at a state tax conference recently, and what's unique about this conference in particular is it's attended by, I would say, a half dozen to a dozen commissioners of revenue on the East Coast. And I, I no joke, in, in setting the legal merits of, of the statement that I'm going about to mention aside, I did see one or two commissioners of revenue stand up in front of an audience with two with 200 people and say, our state had 
this law, this sales use economic nexus provision law on our books well before Wayfair, and it's not right. So it's not retroactive. We enacted the law a couple of years ago, and that was the effective date. Now, setting the legal merits, obviously, of that of the of, aside, it is, you know, I agree. I think most states are going to be, um, you know, are trying to be reasonable and have issued guidance saying you know, they're not going to collect till later, but there still are a, a very small handful out there that it's, it is to be seen what they'll do. Right, right, right. Just to add, Mike, yes, we're coming across the same issue. Some of the states are not budging. I, they don't want to budge. And my clients will say, well, do we have a legal, legal standing here? And I say, sure, if you want to litigate it, right? But they're currently, yeah. <laughs> um, they're, they're not budging. And it's unfortunate because, you know, the case went live in June. I mean, the case passed in June and then to July to say you should have the processes in place, especially for some of these jurisdictions where there is local sales tax rate. I, I, I don't know how much faster they could have got it together to, to, to go live and be able to collect and do all those things. So it's interesting for sure. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I don't know if either you or Lady, you or Dave have any perception, but while I was at this conference, one of the, the topics that came up from the, the commissioner panel that I just previously mentioned was, you know, what they're doing internally, uh, uh, meaning computer software wise, to get their systems up to date, to be able to handle the influx of returns that they think they're about to receive, you know, in whatever the state's effective date is, call it 1119. So, it's it's I, I think we never sort of see that on the taxpayer side, but it's interesting right. that, you know, the states are also struggling with, the you know, getting their procedures ready to be able to not only collect the tax, but also, you know, handle the returns as well. Right. You know, it's been interesting for us um, from state of Washington. We've seen a lot of notices come to our my e-commerce clients, you know, and their first question is, well, how do they know about us or how did they find us? So it's been interesting um, to see that some of these states have actually implemented or, or got software tools that capture some of these online retailers. Um, I, I see a lot of notices coming from Washington and um, a handful from the smaller states. But, you know, my clients are, wait, well, how did they find out? That, that's the question. I was like, well, they're getting smarter and smarter. So um, I would be curious to see, you know, how fast technology wise now they're going to start spending into the infrastructure to support that the wafer decision and enforce it we'll see for 2019 the other organizations we might want to take a look at and um, keep our eyes on is we, we haven't really seen a lot from the the mtc the multi-state tax commission and uh, oftentimes we look to them for some guidance and it'd be interesting if they come out with something in 2019 the other organization for us to, to keep an eye on is the Federation of Tax Administrators, which also often gives us some guidance. And uh, anyway, hold your breath and hold on tight for 2019. And uh, Shannon, are there any questions from our audience today? No, we don't have any questions um, from the audience. So um, I'm not sure if, um, if we can open it up in case somebody has a question or if you'd like to ask a question there is a chat box um, in the system and you're welcome to leave a question there um, um, so let's give folks a couple of of minutes just in case they do have some questions Maybe I'd ask Mike and Lady, uh, if you were to grade the states, which ones are most aggressive? <laughs> uh, Washington, I would say for sure. Washington is in my um, worst case state, um, based on the economic nexus state. But then if we are excluding economic nexus, I would say Texas and California and New York too. Uh. More familiar with the East Coast states on this side, um, you know, but I'm <sighs> Washington's definitely a big one. Um, you know, Massachusetts, I wouldn't necessarily say is one of the most aggressive, but they do tend to be one of the states that has a little bit better published guidance. So 
a lot of times if we don't have really good guidance so elsewhere, you know, you can use, you know, the Washington, the Massachusetts and California in the world just to, as just a mere reference point to see how other states are doing it because sometimes they just have so much more information than a lot of the smaller states. I'll say from California, we do see Massachusetts. So <laughs> that one yeah. quite often. <laughs> All right, well, we don't have any further questions, so I'd like to take the opportunity to thank David and Lady and Mike for joining us and providing their insights into uh, the Wayfair case and how that's going to impact taxpayers here and outside of the U.S. If you have any additional questions, you're welcome to reach out to any one of the panelists. And we also have a general email address for tax issues at tax at hlb.global, and I'm just going to go right back to the individual um, presenters' emails in case you want to direct a question to any one of them. So with that, I hope you have a wonderful week and a wonderful holiday season, and we will talk with you next year. Thank you.